First reading is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, from 1 to 35. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes, for the Lord, fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will bring over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For the Lord, for, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. By wisdom, the Lord led the earth's foundation. By understanding, he sets the heaven in place. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided, and the clouds dropped the dew. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. There will be life for you, and ornaments to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. You will lie down, your, when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the rain that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be at your side. He will keep your foot from being snared. Do not withhold good from those whom it is due, when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I will give it to you, when you already have it with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbor, who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse anyone for no reason, when they have done you no harm. Do not envy the violent or choose any of their ways, for the Lord detests the perverse, but takes, up, takes the upright into his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Submit yourselves to God. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. 
but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, thank you so much for reading the Bible for us. I would love it if you would keep your Bibles open at Proverbs uh, chapter 3. If you are joining us for the first time today, we're at the, near the beginning of a teaching series on the book of Proverbs, so we're teaching our way through all 31 chapters over the next few weeks. We're at Proverbs chapter 3 uh, today, so you'll find it helpful to have the Bible open. There's also a little outline that uh, I hope you were given when you came in. Uh, many of our church family love to have it just beside them to guide their uh, thoughts as we go through it. Sometimes people scribble some comments, uh, some notes. Do take it with you home so that you can continue to dwell on what God says to us. Uh, let's have uh, a time of prayer. Let me pray for us as we prepare to hear God speak uh, through his precious word. So let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we long to be humble as we submit ourselves to you afresh. We pray that we would indeed submit ourselves to your voice that we would long to hear it, we'd long to receive it, uh, we long to hear your gracious words. Uh, many of us um, in our families, in our lives, within ourselves, we experience much brokenness. And so, Father, we pray that we'd hear the tender voice of the Savior as he continues to heal us and knit us together to be more like him. So help us by your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So the question is on the screen, what is the difference uh, between a principle and a promise? Now that is, let me just get this, because that, that is a serious question. It's not my attempt at a joke. Okay, that's not a joke. Um, if I was going to tell you a joke, I would say something like this. Okay, here we go. This is the joke. Uh, what is the difference between a piano and a tuna? You can tune a piano, but you cannot piano a tuna. Are you ready? One more? <laughs> Here we go. What's the difference uh, between a cat and a comma? One, <laughs> someone wants to be up here doing this, doesn't it? So, <laughs> one has claws at the end of its paws. And the, this is basically a grammatical joke for you, Betty. And the other is a pause at the end of a clause. Dum -dum. <laughs> Moses, you should have been at the drums at that point. No, he's shaking his head. Okay, let's move on. That's, that's the joke telling. Right, what I'm asking this morning, uh, it's not a trivial question at all, is it? In fact, far from it. Uh, in a complicated world, um, it is vital to know the difference between a principle and a promise. And that is particularly true if you're a person of faith and you want to remain confident in the goodness of God all the way through your life. Now, that's different from clinging on to the existence of God. It is clinging on to your confidence in the goodness of God, regardless of the circumstances that you face. So what is the difference? Well, here is the difference. A promise, a promise is a firm commitment from someone to do something for someone else. It is a firm commitment. It's a promise. I will do this. You can rely on it. This will be the outcome because I am promising to do it. And you know as well as I do that promises are vital in relationships. And some of you know the hard way, the painful way of what broken promises do they have devastating consequences in personal relationships. So promises matter. 
Broken promises are devastating, but the idea of a promise is a firm commitment that achieves a certain outcome. Now, a principle is different. A principle is a statement about something that is likely to happen in most circumstances if we make certain decisions. That is a principle. This is likely to happen, but the outcome is not 100% guaranteed. You always find exceptions to the rule. That's different from a promise, isn't it? Principle and promise. Now, there are all sorts of principles that we talk about in life. Uh, if you go and see a medic for a, a checkup, I'm of that age now, where text messages appear on my phone and say, you now need to go for this check because you have reached this fine old age. Or well, they don't quite call it a fine old age, do they? But if I go and see the medics, they will say to me, particularly to my younger self, look, if you exercise, if you eat well, then what is likely to happen to you? It is likely that you will live a long time. But it's not a promise, because there are all sorts of exceptions to the people that exercise well and eat well. They don't always live a very long life. You know the opposite of that. For example, it is likely if you smoke 20 cigarettes a day that you will get lung cancer. And if you don't smoke any, then it's fairly certain that you won't. However, it's not always a guaranteed outcome, is it? Sometimes those who smoke don't get that kind of cancer, and sometimes those who don't do. So when we read Proverbs, particularly as today we read Proverbs chapter 3, we need to work out, so what are we being presented with? Uh, are we being presented with promised outcomes that are guaranteed to happen every single time? If we do this, then this is promised to happen. Or are we presented with principles that are mostly always likely to happen but may not depend on conditions? Or is it even more complicated than that? Let me give you some examples. Look at your Bibles. Proverbs chapter 3, at verse 1. My commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. So not just a long life. That's not really what we're after, is it? Just a long life that's rubbish. We would like a long life that is satisfying and happy all the way through the generations. Uh, literally here, a shalom life, a peace life, a, a life that is knitted together in all the different spheres. So as we read on, just look out for this pattern again. At verse 3, the odd one says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them round your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Literally, we're talking here about taking on God's character. Uh, in another part of the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when Moses wants to see the glory of God, uh, God reveals himself to Moses and says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's what God is like. I'm abounding in love and faithfulness. So, take on God's character. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them round your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And then what will happen, verse 4? Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. So here, the consequences are spiritual consequences, spiritual outcomes for those who embrace this way of life. Let's read uh, on. Trust in the Lord. This is some, I know, some of your favorite verses in the Bible. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and what will happen? He will make your path straight. So again, these are, are these promises? Are these principles. Uh, verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. And what will happen? Verse 8, uh, health to the body, nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then what will happen? Your barns will be filled to overflowing. The vats will brim over with wine. So how are we to understand these words? How do they apply to our life situation today? Are these promises that are guaranteed to produce a certain outcome, or are they principles that are generally true, but they have exceptions? Or, as Christians, and some of you are not yet Christians, but you're looking in, but as those of us who live in New Testament days after the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, does that change anything? <laughs> So here are two questions for us to help us grapple with these words. And I do promise, this is a promise, that by the end of the sermon, this will come together. Two key questions that we need to ask and answer. What do these verses mean to the original hearers? And then secondly, what do these verses mean to us? 
because we're not the original hearers. There are differences. So first, uh, what do these verses mean to the original hearers? And when I talk about the original hearers, I don't mean those who heard these proverbs for the very, very, very first time. I'm not talking about those who read these proverbs for the very, very first time. We have no idea who they were. No, what I mean by the original hearers is the big audience that this book of the Bible was designed for and delivered to. Who were the big audience that were reading these words, hearing these words for most of the time they were written? That audience were the Old Testament people of God. And they were the Old Testament people of God and they were living in the promised land. There were different parts of that story of the Old Testament people of God when they went into exile into Babylon. And that's a good question to have in your head about the differences there. But as they lived in the promised land, they were a people who enjoyed many, many privileges. They were a nation. God had given them a beautiful place to live. They were a nation. They had their own rulers. And the rulers were supposed to be good, wise, godly leaders. They were supposed to submit themselves to God's ways. Now, that was the intention. It didn't always work like that. But can you imagine living in a country where you were the holy nation, you had rulers that were part of the holy people, and they submitted themselves to God. They had God's words to guide them. And in those days, and you read this particularly in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Leviticus, uh, there was a clear connection made between being faithful to God and the material blessings that followed. That's the big audience that were reading these words, hearing these words. And because of that background, when they heard those words, they would have been quick to understand what God meant by them. Would they have understood them as promises or principles? Well, from the 10 verses alone, you might be tempted to conclude that all of these would have been understood as guaranteed promises. Do this, and this will definitely be the outcome. However, when you dig a little bit deeper, that doesn't cohere with the bigger story of the section, and it doesn't cohere with the bigger story of the Old Testament. For example, look at verse 11. At my son, do not despise what? The Lord's dis discipline. Uh, do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Isn't that interesting? Even in Proverbs chapter 3, these verses remind us that on occasions, God would deliberately act to bring a period of distress and difficulty to his people. It wasn't all going to be plain sailing. Now, all this discipline will be motivated by God's heart of love. Now, you think, why would God even act to do that, to bring uncomfortable times? Well, for many reasons. But sometimes, you will know this as well as I do, that sometimes God's people love the gifts more than the giver. Ever had that? We love what God gives to us. And on a great day, we love what God gives to us, and we love God himself. But sometimes we're grumpy at God because we love his gifts more than the giver. And when he removes some of the gifts to show our heart adoration, we get grumpy because I, I just want what you can give me, God, not you yourself. So sometimes God brings a period of discipline so that we focus not on the gifts, but on the giver who is all sufficient. And sometimes God sends these things because occasionally God's people value good things more than great things. Uh, for example, comfort. It's a good thing, isn't it? I don't get up in the morning. I don't think you get up in the morning and say, dear God, give me an uncomfortable day. Do you? God, make it as difficult as possible. No, I enjoy my comfort. But comfort's not the ultimate thing. Holiness is more important than comfort. <laughs> But often in my life, I treasure comfort more than holiness. But holiness is for my ultimate good. So in his kindness, God sometimes brings period of discomfort so that I will become more holy. So you see, even, even, in, this, even in this chapter, we're told that it isn't always do this and it'll be rosy. Uh, but what about the book of Job? That's in the Old Testament, the book of Job. Job lost all his property. His children died, and he suffered great physical agony. Why? We well, hadn't done anything wrong. You, you read the book of Job. We know that he is a man of faith and faithfulness. And then all his friends come and come round him, and they give him all that friendly advice. Job, let me tell you, you must have done something really bad. 
Let's have a chat and see how wicked you really are. Oh, why not stay longer? Again and again, they give wrong advice because their mindset is certainly, if you're good, you get good outcomes. Bad outcomes, you must be bad. And it's more complicated than that. The book of Job. Or, or what about um, Psalm uh, 73? I think it's one of my favorite psalms. Uh, you might want to flick open to it. I want to read some of this stuff. Okay, This is the Old Testament. Psalm 73. Here's the opening verse. Verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. There's the opener. Verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Why? For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of whom? The prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. <laughs> Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim on heaven, and their tongues take possession of earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Now in his head he's going, this shouldn't be. Surely that's not how it works. Surely you do good, you get good stuff. But he's looking at the reality of the world around him and he looks at the wicked and they're prospering. And he's struggling. He keeps on going. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishment. If I'd spoken out like this, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it, tr it troubled me deeply. And here's the key turning point. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Bang. But you see... From a human point of view, it wasn't as simple for the Old Testament people of God as saying, if you live like this, you'll prosper, and the bad will not. So as they were looking at these words, not everything was promises, and not everything was principles. As you read through uh, to the Old Testament people of God, the spiritual outcomes that are described in Proverbs chapter 3, they're all promises. But the material outcomes, they're not promises, they are principles, because sometimes it doesn't work out that way, even when they're being faithful. Okay, there's the Old Testament people of God, but we're not Old Testament people of God, so what about us? What do these verses mean to you and me? How should we engage them? You might be a Christian, or you may be someone looking in, you're thinking about following the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to get your expectations right. So what do they mean for people today if they have their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, to answer this, we need to consider what difference, I did this for our young people earlier before the service, I said, when you move from the old to our position now in the New Testament, you've got to realize that one significant person has arrived that has changed everything. And yes, it is the answer you all think. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has come. He has arrived. So we've got to think, what does the arrival of Jesus do? What difference does it make to how we understand Proverbs chapter 3? You know something? In the New Testament, Jesus is presented as the perfect wise man. He is wise. Everything about wisdom that we read in Proverbs is lived out by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're told in Luke uh, chapter 2, when he was growing up, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 40, the child Jesus grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Later on in uh, Luke chapter 2, do you remember when he goes to the temple? He's 12 years old. His parents leave him behind. <laughs> what a great moment that is as a parent. Where is he? You got him? No. You? No. He'll be back somewhere with the others. Anybody got him? No. A day to recognize he don't have a kid. A day to go back and get him. And he's at the temple, 12 years old, and he's talking to all the different religious teachers. And this is the conclusion. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. 
Uh, when he grows up, Matthew chapter 13, uh, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. And this is what they say. Where did he get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? So Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, if you're looking for the ultimate fulfillment of wisdom, you look at the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we go. What was the outcome of Jesus' life? Did he have a particularly comfortable, pain-free life? Not if you read the Gospels. Did he have an extended life, a long life, with lots of material wealth? No. He died at 33. During his life, it was said he had nowhere to rest his head. He's the wise man. So as you read Proverbs chapter 3, and you read the outcomes, let's accelerate to Jesus, and let's go, hang on a minute, what's happening now? Uh, One question, of course, is that Jesus, maybe he's just a unique example, or is he setting the pattern for the experience of his future followers? Because okay, it could well be, you could say, well, Jesus, he was just unique. He was taking all the sin on himself. And after Jesus, it's all back to prosperity, peace, long life. Jesus just the exception. Or is he actually doing something different? Well, listen to what Jesus himself says. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus Christ is saying, let me tell you something. You've got to be my disciple? They're going to persecute you. At Mark chapter 8, then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. So the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ to go to death Suffer and die on the cross. He said, you're going to pick up your cross. Do you think picking up your cross was pleasant? Carrying your cross beam all the way through a public crowd as they mocked you on your way to death? John chapter 15, Jesus says, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. There is a pattern being developed here. And one of the biggest reasons, I think, for why this is the new reality and one of the biggest changes from the Old Testament people of God to the New Testament people of God is what we find at the end of Matthew's gospel. So Matthew chapter 28, remember the, after the resurrection, uh, Jesus uh, says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he says, therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, what is the change that has happened for the New Testament people of God? In the Old Testament, as you live faithfully to God, you were part of this holy nation, and yes, other people could join, but they had to come to you. They were drawn to you. But after the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he gets his disciples together and he says, from this point on, it's going to be different. People are not going to come. You're going to go. You're going to go. God's people are not to stay, but to go. And here's the difference. When you were in the Old Testament, you lived out your faith in a holy nation. In the New Testament, we live out our faith in a hostile world. (laughs) And that changes everything. (laughs) You are now to be the wise person, a servant of the Lord Jesus, not in a nation where everyone's a person of faith, not when all the rulers are people of faith, but you go to hostility. Uh, Pastor James and I were just talking before the service, and he said something that really struck me. I hadn't had it in my notes, but of course, in the Old Testament, when you look at wisdom and action, what happens when they're in Babylon? Well, sometimes the people of wisdom get exalted to high positions, but sometimes the people that live righteously get chucked to the lions. If we don't have this theology, that there is no guarantee of long life, pain-free life with lots of money as you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, let me ask you this question. 
If that's what you think the normal Christian life is, long life, peace, health, and wealth, what words do we have to the young Christian families that were thrown to the lions in the name of sport? What words do we have for the Christians that were used as torches in the Roman streets by the Emperor Nero? What words do we have to faithful Bible teachers burned at the stake for declaring that Jesus Christ is the only one that can save you? What words do we have to our brothers and sisters in Eritrea right now who are being held captive in shipping containers for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? What words do we have for our brothers and sisters in concentration camps in North Korea because they are faithfully serving the King of Kings? There's a connection, isn't there, between the content of the message that we say and how we will be treated. Our message of the gospel is about our suffering Savior. Do you not think there might be some links between what happens to us as we speak about him? So as we finish, some final words from me. Um, How should we engage with what we find in Proverbs chapter 3? What are the promises? What are the principles? I want to say this to you. Everything we read, okay? Everything you read in Proverbs chapter 3, even the stuff I've not had time to do. So go back and read it. Everything in Proverbs chapter 3, whether it is a material outcome or a spiritual outcome, will be perfectly fulfilled when Jesus Christ returns again. I can guarantee that for you. All right, materially, physically, emotionally, spiritually, every single thing will be promised entirely and ultimately and fully when Jesus Christ returns in a way that we cannot even comprehend. Life in the new creation, prefigure in the nation of Israel, will blow your mind away. Breathtaking, beyond our wildest dreams. What about the spiritual outcomes? Every spiritual outcome that you read in Proverbs chapter 3, you can read as a promise to you as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. At Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Promise to you as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let God define what a straight path looks like. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It's the New Testament equivalent, isn't it? And you know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He's always at work. What about the material outcomes that we read in Proverbs uh, chapter 3? Things like long life, comfort, financial prosperity. These are not promises for every Christian in our earthly lives. God may grant you those and bless him for it. However, if he grants you those, uh, there is a bigger purpose for them rather than your personal comfort. See, this life is not our ultimate goal. We are but pilgrims on our way to heaven. And our greatest task is to make it across the finish line with as many people as we can. So if you're not yet a Christian, if you're listening to this, maybe in person, online, uh, keep on learning more about the words and ways of Jesus Christ. They will not disappoint you. It is actually what your heart craves for. And if you are a Christian, then let us enjoy reading all of Proverbs chapter 3, but as Christian scripture. And as we do, keep on trusting in the goodness of God as we navigate our way through a complicated world. And when God doesn't grant you the physical existence that you crave, there's no need to get upset with him. He will definitely give us what we crave and so much more in the world to come. And he may decide to give you a little bit now. But regardless of how much money is in your bank account or whatever appears on your medical scan, the truth remains the same. God is with us, he is ahead of us, and he is wisely working out all his purposes for our ultimate good and his greater glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are aware that there is a real depth to understanding these words. And we crave your understanding and wisdom. Uh, We pray, Lord, that we would never let go of your goodness 
And so help us to treasure the promise that you're always working things out in every detail for our greater good and for your greater glory. So fill us afresh with your spirit, we pray, so that we can believe these words and live them out each day for the glory of Christ. Amen.